what's going on, y'all? T-Bob here. And Jake as well. And you're about to watch a little OTB LSU. We're going to give you all the latest, greatest between LSU football, baseball, women's basketball, softball, and everything in between. Bottom line, if you want to talk Tigers, keep it locked, subscribe, like it, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. I want to start, so this is something that uh, Taylor, Taylor's been wanting to do here, and uh, it's an article on Louisiana Sports on that, something that Jake's done for a while here as well, is looking at these PFF grades um, out of this LSU loss over the weekend, and uh, in no real surprise here in terms of the highest grades. Uh, Will Campbell, number one, at a 74.8. Emory Jones, number two, right behind him at a 73.5. Uh, Zai Alexander, a corner, a 71.5. I mean, they played a lot of man coverage, and Zai held his own the majority of the game. Uh, this is maybe a bit surprising to see, but Sage Ryan, fourth, with the greatest 67. And then Braden Swinson at 67. Really, Sage is the only one I find it to be a bit surprising there. But more interesting than the highest grades would be the lowest grades. At number five, you got Paul Mabinga, uh, 47-3. No surprise there. You could clearly see him struggling. And number four, you got Ashton Stamps at a 47. I, I you know, I, I didn't I didn't think that Stamps, I mean, I understand that he got beat. I didn't, I didn't think it like I mean he got beat in big plays. So it is what it is. I it didn't jump off the film to me that he had a god awful game, but I probably wasn't watching the DBs close enough. Uh, uh, he got beat. You know, he got beat for a touchdown. He got beat uh, on like a little bit of a rail down route. the yeah. sideline. Yeah. yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I know he got beat a couple times, but I mean, to get a minus on over yeah. 50% of your plays, I guess it just wasn't as noticeable as a Mabinga. But that's probably my own biases and how I'm watching the film coming through. No, I agree with you there. I mean, it was definitely more noticeable, even on tape, um, Mabinga. Chris Hilton. Uh, Chris Hilton coming in at number three at a 46-2. Again, no surprise there. Uh, this one is surprising to me. Paris Shand at a 45-3. Um, I think the interior D-line had a weird day where they would kind of get knocked off the ball, but then they would fight back and they would, you know, not they, like they didn't allow for an effective running game. So th- I did find that to be a bit interesting. Uh, but maybe the most shocking uh, number on here, Whit Weeks, the lowest graded player on the LSU Tigers, Jake, and it was not even particularly close as they graded him. Pro Football focused it at a 35-9. Parishan, number two on the list at a 45-3. Witt at a 35-9. Uh, what went so wrong for Witt this week? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have guessed it necessarily based off the tape that that would have been the case. Now, you do have to break it down into different portions of how you got to the overall grade and for, you know, against the run, he was 47.6 pass rush. He was 62. And then coverage is where really mm. the grade slips 33.3%. Uh, and so you, again, you break it down, you know, in multiple ways to kind of get to the grade there. Um, definitely could see some stuff in coverage there, but I, I didn't have him as a 35.8. No, I thought he was ineffective. Uh, but uh, again, yeah, I, I also did not have it as, as being disastrous. Um, and given that when I look at the defensive performance, I thought the defense was actually fine overall. Uh, I think they stopped the run. Well, I think they did give up too many big plays, but ultimately I think it was the offense, uh, not coming through on the other side of the ball. That was kind of the, the story, uh, the story of this game. But I do know this about Whit Weeks, right? He hears something like this. Uh, he is going to log this and use this as motivation to come back hungrier and better than ever. And honestly, um, so he too, the same way, the same things I said about Garrett Nussmeyer yesterday. First year starter, therefore learning the rhythms of uh, what a season entails and the ups and downs therein. And in that same way, Whit Weeks was on this incredible run that crescendos with the Talon Green play and a million tackles, and he's leading the SEC in tackles, and he's this huge playmaker, difference maker. And then even go back to the, the Alabama game, I mean, he had a ton of tackles. Uh, okay, see, okay, see, so in the Alabama game, I thought, I thought um, maybe just because everything was so bad, I thought. Um, Maybe the tackles are play, taking place downhill. I don't know. I, I I guess I don't think about that being like the uh, victorious Whit Weeks moment. But maybe no, I'm I mean, I was just saying like it wasn't like it's been uh, a little. He had 15 tackles. He had 15 tackles had 15 against, against, Alabama. against Alabama. Had a tackle for loss uh, 
uh, broke up a pass. So my whole point was like it's not like it's just been gradually getting you know worse and it's been getting bad over time. It was really I feel like this is the outlier. Game. Okay, so this was just one game in which he did not have it. And now you got to see how he's going yeah. to respond. Uh, how how will he respond to a bit of adversity here, being the lowest graded player emerging? I, and I do know this. When you talk about defending Vanderbilt, uh, the discipline that it's going to take their quarterback, Diego Pavia, one of the more exciting quarterbacks in the entire country, um, a guy with excellent legs. They run a kind of modern pseudo triple option attack. And we do know this. When you're preparing for the option, you have to be assignment sound. You have to be disciplined. You have to play with excellent angles. As Brian Kelly would say, you can't have a lot of air in the defense. Unfortunately, uh, these are all some of the problems that have cropped up with this LSU defense throughout this season, um, especially kind of the, the the angles and sometimes that assignment discipline in the run game. So Vanderbilt's offense does uh, represent uh, an interesting challenge in terms of maybe exploiting where LSU's not been the best this year. And so weeks, especially the line, but everybody going to be critical this week to trying to stop Pavia and company. Yeah, they are. I mean, you're talking about a quarterback that's rushed for over 600 yards this yeah. year. I mean, you're talking about somebody that can change a game in a hurry. And this offense has a lot of bells and whistles, man. They they create eye violations all over the place. And so you have to be sound because if you're not, they'll be going the other way for 60. They've done it to almost everybody they've played. Now, teams have fared better as of late than they did early in the season. So you're getting a little bit of a book out on Vanderbilt, but... Like, that's what this offense is. It's like, you know, dangling the carrot one way to go the complete opposite way. And if you don't play discipline, which LSU's defense at times, as we know, yep. certainly like in some of these run fits, is not. Well, I mean, look, I mean, they they, they, they got Alabama with this. They damn near got Texas with this. They've, they've got a lot of teams uh, with, with, with that whole dangling the carrot kind of scheme. And so I'm, I'm going to be – Fascinating to see what Blake Baker and company can put together. Uh, how much pride. I, you know, and, and overall, this LSU team, I like the defense. So I think the coach staff's doing a good job. I think they're really maximizing in a lot of ways. I think all of the problems almost exclusively right now, almost, but are, are on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, they're so large as to kind of overwhelm uh, the critiques that I have on the defense, which are lesser. Wow, Jake, what incredible takes. I mean, those guys, they're just the best. Uh, I think so. And if you think so, again, hit the like button, subscribe, ring the bell so you get notifications when we post every single day here on OTB LSU.